Austria had lost the war and its empire. Vienna was a cold and hungry city. Revolution was in the air. Socialists and communists were winning the battle for hearts and minds. Young and idealistic, Friedrich von Hayek enrolled at the University of Vienna. It was during the war that I more or less decided to do economics. I really got hooked. Socialism seemed to promise a more just society. Albert Zlebinger, a former pupil and disciple of Hayek. He openly said that he at one time was a socialist of the mild sort, where concerns for the poor and concerns for fairness and equity would help to determine government policy. Much of Vienna's intellectual life took place outside the university, in the coffee houses, across the Ringstrasse. There were informal seminars for those who loved discussion and argument. Hayek joined the circle of a passionate libertarian called Ludwig von Mises. Von Mises believed markets, like people, needed to be free from government meddling. Ludwig von Mises was the preeminent economist of the Austrian school, the distinguishing hallmark of the Austrian school of economic thought is that markets work and governments don't. Von Mises predicted that the new Soviet socialist economy would never work, precisely because the government controlled wages and prices. What von Mises said is that the great flaw of socialism is that it doesn't have a functioning price system to send all the signals to consumers and producers as to what something is worth. That these prices are at the very heart of what makes a functioning economy work. You can think of them as traffic signals. And if you don't have them, what you get is a system that doesn't work or you get chaos. Mises argued that free markets do it best. Why fool with anything else? In Soviet Russia, it seemed as if von Mises' predictions were coming true. Lenin had abolished what he saw as the chaos of free markets. The state controlled the economy. Wages and prices were fixed. But the great Marxist experiment was in trouble. Lenin had an economic disaster on his hands. Soviet Russia was a grim place, haunted by cold, famine, hunger, and death. Lenin knew that he needed a different kind of policy and he instituted what became known as the new economic policy. Lenin says farmers can sell their own goods and own their own land. He says that small businesses can operate and you start to get an economic revival. Well, his comrades on the left attacked him viciously for selling out the principles of Bolshevikism and Marxism. And Lenin, who by this time had already had a stroke, was not well, nevertheless pulled himself up on the platform for one of the very last times in his life. And he was still the old Lenin. He was vitriolic, he was sarcastic. His critics, he said, were fools, were stupid, because the state, the government, the Bolsheviks, would control the overall economy. Steel, railroads, coal, the heavy industries, what he called the commanding heights of the economy.
Within a year, Lenin was dead. The mourners at Lenin's funeral believed that history was on their side. And in less than 30 years, not only Russia, but Eastern Europe, China, more than a third of humanity would be living according to the economic tenets of Marxist-Leninism. Lenin's successor would tighten the Communist Party's iron grip on the commanding heights of the economy. Joseph Stalin introduced central planning. Under him, the Communist Party planned and managed every aspect of the economy. While communism seemed to be forging ahead, capitalism looked to be doomed. Watch all of Commanding Heights online at pbs.org. This enhanced netcast links to an interactive time map, country reports, economic data, and important full-length interviews about the future world economy. Commanding Heights video set and book are available from WGBH Boston Video. To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424.